you have a good night? Did you have good meditations? Hopefully. I will invite you to go with me to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 2. And I'll read from verse 1 to verse 3. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Loving Father, we want to thank you that you have brought us together. It's not just for our own lives that we are here, but it's for this land of South Africa. It's on behalf of all our brothers and sisters from all denominations of Christianity, and on behalf of all the peoples of South Africa, so we pray, Master, minister to us like only you can. Bring us revelation, understanding, and wisdom. Master God, cause your word to come, become life within us. That we, as we apply it, we shall see the effect of it in the land. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture, the passage you've just read, is one of the richest in the whole Bible concerning the spiritual realm. Here, Paul was speaking to the Ephesians. The Ephesians who were believers and was addressing them about their current life as well as their old life. Concerning the old life, he said, God has now made you alive. In the previous times, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So here we are seeing the contrast of these two lives. Now you are alive. But in the past, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Just as a quick passing, I want you to notice that when someone is dead, even if they have billions and billions of dollars in the bank, they cannot pay their debts. Neither can they pay for their casket. They depend on others. They are completely helpless. They are in the hands of somebody else. And uh, Paul was making this equivalent. That when we were in the other life, we were dead. We could not help ourselves. We were captives. We were at the mercy of those who were controlling us. Remember Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Don't you know that to whom you give yourselves to obey, you are slaves of him whom you obey? So when we were in the world and were captives of the devil, we were slaves. We couldn't even help ourselves. Even the things that we laid claim upon, we did not really have the power to enjoy them. We were captives and we were living lives that were dictated by others. That's the first point I would like us to take note of. And if it means that, then let us put ourselves in there feet of the Ephesians. Now they are born again. Now they are free. But once they were dead. What does that say about our fellow countrymen in South Africa? It simply says those who have come to know him, the Lord Jesus, are born again, are free, are set free. But the rest as much as we can see them flaunting wealth, power, fame, 
They are dead in their sins and trespasses. They may claim to have the authority over the, the world and over the nation, but the truth is they are just being driven. One of the things that I find so strange is the politics of the United States of America today. You hear people say things that you would never expect a person who understands well to say. They are fighting for the right for boys to go in girls' toilets. For boys to go into girls' lockers. And you think, wait a moment, out of what kind of background are you fighting for that? And to what end? What are you trying to accomplish? You're fighting for the right for children to get surgical changes to their bodies without their parents knowing. You're fighting for the right for the teacher to direct the life of a child well, well and beyond the parent. And you think, where is that going to take us? As long as we do not see it for what it really is, we think we are dealing with politicians with funny ideas. But the truth is we are dealing with the spiritual realm. And the sooner we recognize it, the sooner we take authority as we know how to. It's no, long, it's no good arguing with men. They are simply captives. They're being driven. They're being given what to say. The only way we can fight and win is to go at the root source and deal with the spiritual powers behind their actions and their words. I hope I'm beginning to make sense when it comes to fighting or contending for the destiny of a nation. So, Paul says, we were dead in our sins and trespasses in which you used to walk once according to the course of this world. Now, listen to these phrases. One, according to the course of this world. Two, according to the prince of the power of the air. Three, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Listen to that. Paul is saying, you know, remember how you used to live. The things you used to crave about. The things you thought were joy. You would go on binges of all kinds and you would think, oh, we enjoyed so much. Today you think about it and it's all foolishness. Doesn't make sense. So what was, what caused you to pursue that kind of life? He said, you know what? You were living according to the course of this world. That means, let me give you this. Every time I go to the source of the Nile in Uganda, Ginger, I look at this river. It's the longest river in the world. And it's one of the most famous because of the history. But can you think about it? It's been running that course for thousands and thousands of years. It has never got tired of that course. It has never decided, now we are not going to go down to Egypt, we are going to go to Congo. It passes very close to the border with Congo, but still continues through the Sudan to Egypt and to the Mediterranean. That course of the river is a very good example of the course of the world. That there is a charted course which we don't see with our human eyes, but we find ourselves uh, following it involuntarily, without any effort. We simply follow the course of the world. And the way to understand is, I don't know, I hear the scientists say that the way people take a shower is the same every day. <laughs> if they start by scrubbing their left arm, they will always do that from year to year to year to year to year. 
That's the way they are programmed and tuned. And if that is true, it's true about the course of the world. You simply do certain things certain ways. You wake up and you go through the routine of waking up. No one has ever given you a course in how to wake up, but somehow you follow the course. And if you understand that, then you understand what we mean by the course of this world. That human beings are programmed to follow a certain course. They do certain things after other things, and they do certain things a certain way without thinking. And they'll always do that unless something comes in to break the routine. And this course of the world is, I could use other words like the system of the world. And it comes from the thinking. It starts in the mind. There's a certain way you think. And because you think that way, so you act that way, you speak that way, you relate that way, or you don't relate. One time I was teaching on presumptions. And the Lord used to speak to us. We would be in prayer, and he would come and speak to us prophetically and say, avoid presumptions. Presumptions means, because of this, and that, it means that. And you, it's amazing how sure we convince ourselves it must be that. Now, one day, and I think the Lord allowed it because I was teaching it, but I didn't understand it. I thought I did. So one day, I was staying with a brother. Right now, later on, he married my sister. So he's my brother-in-law. I was, I was staying in his house. By then, he wasn't yet married to my sister. And uh, my home was out of town. So I couldn't commute from my home to come. I was serving under the Maurice Cellulo ministry. Maurice Cellulo was coming to Uganda. So I was part of, in charge of the mobilization. So I asked him, can I stay with you for these months? He said, oh, no problem. And I stayed with him. Okay, I st first stayed with his brother, who had married a girl who was part of my worship team. And I stayed with them. But then they asked me after a month, uh, would you mind if you changed and went and stayed with George? Because we are newly married and uh, we feel we need the space. Do you mind? Now, in my human way, I took it personal. I thought, oh, they don't want my company. So they have pushed me. And all of this, I had given shelter to the girl for many years. I had been with the boy for many years. And I thought, they don't even remember all that I did for them. Okay. So I consented grudgingly. So I went to George and George said, oh, no problem, no problem. You can come and stay with me. And uh, George was working. Uh, he had a carpentry and was making very good furniture. But I gave him a word because I felt it was from the Lord that he should reduce on his time in his business and give more time to ministry. And uh, I don't think he took it well. But the next day, I came back from work. I was working with the Maurice Salulu ministry. So I came back from work, and they, I had a key. He had given me a key to his house. I came back and put in the key. The key was not opening. I thought, what's wrong? Then on looking close, I realized there's a new lock. So in, I said, oh my, so it has come to this. Because I told you about the business, now you have locked me out. I felt so sad. And I went around, 
I said, okay, let me wait around. I don't have, if, if they don't come back in time, then I'll have to go to my sister's place, which was not very far, maybe about an hour's walk away. And so I, work, I walked in a very, very, it's a very busy trading center. I was walking and I was thinking about all the things I'd done for George. <laughs> and this is how he's repaying me. But, but I didn't say ba anything bad. If you didn't believe what I said, just leave it. Why lock me out? And I was getting more and more agitated. Then I came across a, a mutual friend of ours. He's called Henry. And I said, oh, Pastor John, I was so worried that maybe you'll come back when I'm not, when I'm not home. But thank God I've seen you. George gave me a key for you. <laughs> you know, he came home and he had lost his key, so he had to go and buy a new lock. He put in a new lock and he left me with a key for you. I thought, oh my God. Oh my God. All those thoughts I thought. All those things. What was God thinking about me? He was seeing me think all these negative thoughts and evil thoughts. What was... Oh, I felt so ashamed. And I thought... It's not good to be quick to make presumptions. Yeah. To assume you understand, you can interpret everything. And actually, I waited until when George came back, I said, George, you sit down. I must tell you about this. This is what I thought about you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the illustration I want to make here is presumption. In this life, people make presumption. Because of this, and then this, Otherwise, why would he have done that? It, it's just that. I know it. I know it. And then we form opinions. Then we take sides. And then we take attitudes. And we end up doing evil. Feeling justified. That we understand what is happening. And this happens to me when people say, Oh, so and so said you said this, therefore you did this, and you are doing this. And I'm thinking, oh my God. My friends here will tell you how many times I say, and every vain word that people say, they'll give account of it on that day. For our words will determine our righteousness or our condemnation. Beloved, I know that I'm susceptible to this. I can easily fall in this. So I hold myself back. When I'm making a conclusion, I say, wait a moment. You don't know all the facts. Give it time. Give it the benefit of a doubt. And many, many times I find I was wrong. And thank God I didn't act on that presumption. And it doesn't matter how much you teach about this. People will always fall in it until they realize it's part of their warfare. When you realize, oh my God, if I, make, I allow myself to fall into such pitfalls, I'm opening up myself. I become, I'm becoming vulnerable to spiritual manipulation. Then you learn how to watch. It's better to be taken for a fool than to make yourself a fool. Amen? <laughs> when we start teaching and practicing real spiritual affair, you'll be amazed at how much it is part of this day-to-day -day life. Day-to-day -day thoughts, words, actions, attitudes, the way we look at things. And that opens us up or keeps us protected. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's come back to this. <laughs> so, Paul is teaching the Ephesians you were also dead in your sins and trespasses in which you used to walk. But God has just made you alive. Now you are a new breed. You are different. But once, when you are still there, you walked according to the course of this world. There is a way the world expects you to think, to act, to relate, 
And if you don't, people call you a fool. You say, come on, what kind of person? Look, they do this to you and you continue as if nothing has happened? Ah, not me. And I've heard men of God, women of God, full of the Holy Spirit, who love to be known as spiritual ministers of God, take stands and they say, you mean you did that? You let it go? <laughs> not me. I'm thinking, you need to hear yourself. You are declaring you have no room to walk with Christ in that matter. You would rather walk in the flesh. So there is a course of the world. There's a way the world expects you to think, to speak, to relate. And even when you don't, people assume he's just covering it up. No, he must be feeling like this. He's just covering it up. That's why Jesus said, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. The world is not supposed to dictate our ways. So when we follow the course of the world, Paul goes on to explain who is in control of our lives. When we are following the course of the world, we are living according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, in case you wonder who this prince is, he goes on to explain that prince is the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So, what he's saying is, look at all your fellow countrymen, those who do not know Christ as a personal savior. And you can conclude, according to the scriptures, that they are all under this kind of influence. They are under the prince of the power of the air. Who is this prince? If you go into chapter 6 of the same book, Ephesians, verse 12, it says, For we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and the host of of spiritual wickedness in high places. Here he called it the prince of the power of the air. I want you to capture two things. One, there is a prince. Two, there is a power. You can also put it in simpler language and say, the ruler of the government of the air. And in that government, there is a whole setup of spiritual hierarchies. And there are rulers of the darkness of this world. They are a host of spiritual wickedness in high places. I normally say to people, we have three levels of governmental darkness. The first level is inside each one of us. It manifests as our habits, our ways, our sensitivities or sensibilities, the things that rub others negatively and they have to tolerate us. They bear with us. They know we have those weaknesses. And sometimes someone says, I don't understand. Why did he do this? Why did she do this? I say, oh, yeah, you leave him. He has that weakness. They call it that. But in, in essence, it is a manifestation of the kingdom of darkness in your life. Those are the things, if you go back and read certain passages, those who are of the spirit do not do these things. And they, they make a list, these, these, these. I say, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you look at Christians and you see those things there. Sometimes we fail to understand the fact that they are there does not mean they are not born again. They are born again, but they are in the process. The redemption is still taking place. The redemption is not overnight. It's still taking place. And the Lord does not condemn us for those being there, but he's encouraging us, die to the old man. Put to death those 
old ways. And because in our day to day, we want to choose between black and white. When we see the things in us and yet we are convinced we are born again, therefore we begin to teach, God does not care. You can go ahead with them. God is okay with them. That is a lie. Otherwise, he wouldn't put in his word, those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you find teachings today, they call it the hyper grace, where we tell people, oh, the grace is bigger than any sin, even if you have just committed sin, and you and Jesus comes back, you are going to heaven because the grace is bigger. We have failed to balance. The work of redemption is not overnight. The work by faith is overnight. The moment you believe, you're pronounced righteous. But the practical outworking of that victory is not overnight. We get to grow into it day by day. Day by day. And the more we understand, we come to revelation, we hate the old as we embrace the new. And then we learn also to be gracious to others who are still grappling with some of the things we may have overcome. We realize the fact that they are grappling with them does not mean they are wicked and evil. They are working through their redemption. But that, that doesn't condone what they are going through as being okay. So we know how to pray for one another. And we pray that God will give us the victory. The problem today is we have people who are purporting to speak for God. And they say, God loves you. God is for you. And uh, God doesn't care what goes on in your life. You can just continue. He loves you so much, everything doesn't matter. Then why did he give his only begotten son? If it didn't, it didn't matter, he would have just said, forget it. I love you. Let's move on together. But it was important enough for him to say, let's first deal with this. I will give my son to pay for it all so that you are free. Then we can be family. I hope we are on the same page. Because I don't want to spend too much time here. The fact is, there are three levels of darkness or governmental darkness. The first level is inside of us. And it controls us until we open our eyes to its reality and we say no. And as we say no, the change begins to take place. Look at someone who is quarrelsome. Quarreling is negative in the eyes of others. But maybe in their own eyes, they say, they call it, I have no time for nonsense. I am a perfectionist. I don't want you to play around with my time. I have no time. So they end up in quarrelsome activities all the time. The reason they do it is not to become nags and to, to become a burden to others. They think they are being excellent. They think they are not tolerating. In, but the best, I mean, quarreling is not the best way to handle it. There are other ways we can handle it. And as we grow and mature and allow the Holy Spirit to bear fruits through us, we become better people. We become less quarrelsome. People notice it and they say, he's growing. He's able to handle things better than he used to. Amen? Amen? So, there are, it's important for us to recognize that is the work of the devil. That's the work of the flesh. And there are lists in the Bible. The works of the flesh are manifest. So the first level is the governmental darkness within us. The second level is the governmental darkness in society around us. And I'll give you about five areas where we need to look. The first area is in the realm of worship. Some people call it religion. But I want to call it worship because worship is the, an exchange between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. 
when we are worshiping, we are moving from the physical into the spiritual, and we are drawing from the spiritual into the physical. Now, you can do that with Jesus Christ and his kingdom, or you can do it with the kingdom of darkness, with spirits and demons. There are people who transact in the spirit with the other kingdom. Are you with me? I know you have the Sangomas here. You know, some, some people back in Uganda who are ordinary folks come to South Africa and become Sangomas. <laughs> and they go back to Uganda and say the South Africans are so gullible and uh, they go there and make money. They, they don't even have any special demon with them. <laughs> but anyway, in the spiritual realm, in the realm of worship, there are people who are agents to help others, to win others into the realm of the devil. The worship of the devil, the fear of the devil, the reverence of the devil, and all that kind of thing. So it's all in the name of religious activity or some kind of worship. So that's one. We are either transacting the Christ way or we are transacting the Satan way. Satanic way. Two, is family. Family is fr from God. He's the one who said it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper meet for him. So the idea of man and woman having an intimate relationship between them is from God. But that doesn't mean that whoever is engaging in intimacy is doing it God's way. There are many others who are engaging in this kind of intimacy, but not the godly way. They are being sexual, they are being sensual, they are being intimate, but they are doing it in service of the flesh and in acknowledgement of ways of darkness. And that's where you find all the hollow tray, the prostitution, the sex trade, and all of the things that are being done which are exploiting the good things God gave to human man, humankind and using them to serve darkness. These five things I'm mentioning, I normally call them the five spheres of society. Every society has got these five things. One, the, the realm of worship. The realm where the people of that society open themselves up to spiritual transactions in the form of religious practices. Two is family. In family, we find intimacy, marriage, courtship, parenting, and all that kind of thing that goes with family, as God intended it, but ma sometimes man handles it in a way God never intended it. And that just tells you the kind of powers behind who is influencing? Is it the spirit of God or the spirit of the world? Three is economics. From Genesis chapter 1, we see God put certain things under man and gives him the power. Go, subdue, have dominion, multiply. And what that kind of multiplication is talking about is primarily economic multiplication. He gave him power to use anything. God goes on to mention the gold that was in the garden, the onyx, the diamonds, and all those things. Those were all put there. God put them there in their raw state and gave man, go have, have dominion. The, 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 the act of taking them from their raw state into their most precious state and then making use of them is called economic activity. That's where you find the mining, that's where you find the refining, that's where you find the banking, that's where you find the exchange, the trade, and all those kind of things. That's all economics. And God knows economics is very, very important. When his people, the Hebrews, were in Egypt for so many hundreds of years, and he came down and spoke to Moses and said, I'm going to get them out. He said, I'm not going to get them out empty-handed. 
I'm going to cause them to loot the Egyptians and take away their wealth. Why? Because every nation needs wealth. Every nation needs resources to be able to build itself. And God knows that because he's the author of nations. And this Moses spoke to the Hebrews in, Gen in Deuteronomy 8, 18. And it says, don't you forget the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to create wealth that he may confirm his covenant amongst you. So God knows wealth is important for what? That the people may build those structures, foundations, and systems to sustain his kingdom in the land. And that, that has never stopped being true. As it was true in Genesis, true in Deuteronomy, it is true today. If God wants his kingdom in South Africa, God knows you do that by laying the right foundations, systems, and rhythms in the land that will allow his kingdom to prosper. And you do that with economic resources. So, economics is part of the kingdom. But that doesn't mean the devil cannot take over economics. The devil can take over your resources and use them for his purposes. One of the richest countries today in the world is the United States of America. And it's one of the most generous countries in the whole world. But it's also one that squanders most when it comes to supporting evil, supporting nudity, supporting promiscuity, supporting all kinds of negatives that harm humankind. Why? Because there's a contention for the nation and all that pertains to the nation. Having being a rich country now is not enough in itself. It's what you use your wealth for. Who is stewarding your wealth and towards what purposes? So South Africa, South Africa is not a poor country. It's not a poor country in any form. It is a very wealthy land with so much resources, including human resources. The, part, the question is, who is stewarding these resources? And how are they being made, put to use and towards what goals and ends? And if the Lord Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you lose on earth shall be lost in heaven, are we happy the way the resources of the land are being stewarded? We began this fight way back in 1995 in Uganda. The Lord spoke to us about minerals which had not been made public at that time. And he says, there's oil in this land. There's gold in this land. There's this in this land. But I'm, I'm putting brakes on how these resources are being exploited so that the church may become ready and be able to position itself where it can steward the resources for the kingdom purposes. Otherwise, you can have wealth in the land, but it's all in the hands of the wicked. And it's all going towards wicked targets. Discipling a nation is not just having big churches. It is taking the nation and anchor it in the kingdom of God. In all its forms. So those are three. What are the three? The first one was what? Worship. Two. Family. Three. Economy. The fourth is governance. Governance. You know from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, God says, let us now make man in our own image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. He created man for governance for management of society, for administration of life in communities. And if we fail, we end up living in the same communities but having no power to manage the society, to administer the resources. We become victims in our own land. I remember in the book of Ecclesiastics, Solomon said, one evil that I've seen 
when slaves ride on, horse, on horses while princes walk on foot. That's an evil. When slaves are riding and princes and princesses are walking on foot. They have forsaken. They have given up on their right to manage the resources of the land. And now the ones that are supposed to be slaves are the ones in charge. If it happened then, it can happen today. And if it's happening today, should we sit back and say, alas, Oh, we say, come on, let's rise up and take our rightful position. This is part of all that we are talking about, discipling a nation. Taking the nation back into the original picture that God intended for human society to be like. And the last one, okay, with the, the governance, it goes with justice in the land. It goes with equity. Is, are there equal opportunities for everyone? Is everybody equally protected under the law? Does everybody enjoy the rights of life in the land? And if it's not, instead of crying, oh, this is not right, oh, this is not right, come on. Let us step into those offices that are, will fight for that. Advocacy for equal rights, for equal opportunities, for e an equal society. I know that church does not normally see itself as engaged in this, but then who? Who should fight for the justice of the land? Who should fight for equity in the land? Who should fight to see that everybody is treated the same? Governance, including Lawmaking, judiciary or executing justice, including the, the executive or carrying out the programs of the people for the furtherance of the society, including law, maintenance of law and order, because if, where there's no law and order, is that where the Holy Spirit is? Where the spirit is, there's peace and there's order. Not only in the church, but also in the land. If you notice, we are stretching our understanding of the kingdom of God. From being in the four walls of church to going out into the landscape of society outside there. And we are saying this prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ should come to pass. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no any other group of people that can make it happen except the church. And lastly, and I say these five are present in every human society wherever you go. Doesn't matter whether it's in the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere, whether it's in the western or the eastern, these five. Worship or religious activity, family, economy, governance. And then the last one is the most tricky one. I normally call it social norms. The things we call normal practices of society. The normal behaviors. Uh, my first time to go to England many, many years ago. I was told England is the only, oh, is it Britain? The only country without a written constitution. And do you know how they were able to do that? They were very much uh, monogenous. I mean, they were not a mixed people. The people of the land were predominant. And their culture and their social norms were accepted by those who came in, so they didn't have a written constitution. Just as you, in your own, among your own people, there are things you say, a person does not do that in public. For example, when I first went to London, I 
we were walking on the streets of London, and I saw a man in a, a gray suit, very smart. And he was walking very fast, going back to the hotel with a sandwich in his hands, and he was fighting. And, and in Uganda, we don't do that. <laughs> you do that, and they call you, mm -mm. if you were planning to marry someone's daughter, they say, don't even, don't think about it. He eats on the streets. <laughs> that is an unwritten code of ethics in our society. But in London, they had gone beyond that. They had gone to the point where it's no use sitting down to eat this lunch when I'm getting late to go back to work. I would rather eat while I'm walking so I can make it back to the office. Every, there's no right and wrong, by the way. Everyone has got a reason why they are doing what they are doing. What is important is to know the code of ethics in that society. Paul says, when I go to the Romans, I behave like a Roman. Not because Romans are right or wrong, but because that's what is acceptable among them. Otherwise, you're going to offend everybody and you're going to gain nothing. So what we call the social norms of a society are those codes acceptable to that society. I remember the year, I think it was 1980. It was 1994 when a, a certain musician from Congo called Shalamwana, she visited Uganda. And she did just a concert for two days. But she left a mark on Kampala. Because Shala Mwana put on a dress with a slit nobody had ever seen in Kampala. <laughs> the slit was way to the waist. <laughs> and when she would move on the stage, everybody was saying, Whoa! <laughs> So part of the audience was not there for the music. They were there for the, have you seen that? And when Shala left the next week, all Kampala was full of sleeves like that. People were walking with... <laughs> and there was an outcry. Say, hey, why did this woman live in our city? So she came in, bombarded, and left. But she left the deposit behind. And that was a spiritual deposit. We either had to accept it and allow it to become part of our society, or we had to say, no way. Are you with me? I'm just trying to bring illustrations to help us understand. Social norms are what society accepts as acceptable or rejects and says, no way, no way. Now, Uganda has been in the headlines, and now I'm not political, by the way. I am just a servant of the Lord, preaching the word of God, and you allow me to take middle lane. Huh? I know South Africa, by and large, has taken another lane concerning gay rights and things like that. It's just that we are different societies. It's, there's no right and wrong. We are not saying you are wrong. Who are we to say you are wrong? And who are you to say we are wrong? We're just saying these are two different societies. One society says, mm-mm, that is not a practice acceptable in our Society. Another society says, with us, it's trendy. Okay. I, I hope you are with me. I'm daring to be able to stand up here and say these things. Because I have no guilty conscience about any of this. I'm just trying to make you understand. Every society has got codes of ethics. If you're going to win into Christ, you need to study the society. You need to be able to say... What kind of message do I bring to these people that will cause them to listen to me? Otherwise, you see in the Bible, when Paul was trying to preach to the Greeks, they, they called him a bubbling fool. Say, so what is he bubbling about? Yeah, sometimes that's how society will call you. And it's no use persisting to continue bubbling. Change your language. Speak to them in the way they value. And they appreciate. Okay. Why am I doing all this? Why am I sharing all this? Because we are talking about go nations. 
They're talking about winning nations to Christ. And going back to that scripture that I first gave you, Ephesians chapter 2. Now we are different people. We are now alive. He has made us alive. But we were dead in our sins and trespasses before. So to understand how to win the rest of our countrymen, let us go back and study what we were before we came to the Lord. We were in this land following the course of this world. The systems were dictating how we lived, how we talked, how we related. And when Christ came alive, there are certain things we rejected. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's not acceptable to my father. I now belong to another kingdom. And in my kingdom, my father's kingdom, that's not acceptable. So I live by the systems of my father's kingdom. So there's need to understand the course of this world. Two, who is controlling the course of this world? The spirit, the prince of the power of the air. In other words, the prince of the government of the air. There is a whole government up there which dictates what goes on on the ground. And in that government, there are hierarchies. There are princes. There are rulers. They are hosts of spiritual weakness. Do you remember in the book of Daniel? Daniel was an exile, a Jewish exile in Babylon. And he read in the scriptures of Paul, I mean, Jeremiah, the prophet, that after 70 years, they're supposed to be going back to their land. 70 years had passed, and they were not yet going back. So he spent time in fasting. And what was he looking for? Understanding. He set himself to seek God for understanding. And 21 days he was in fasting without any answer. On the 21st day, the angel appears to him. Now, just give me your attention. What happened when this angel appeared? This angel was such a glorious being. So powerful. So bright that when Daniel saw him, he fell down as dead. And those who were near to him, they fled. They all fled. And he was like a dead man. Then this powerful creature came and touched him. Said, hey, it's well, man, beloved of God, rise up, for I have come to bring you understanding. Then this glorious, powerful being told him, Daniel, from the very first day you began to pray, I was deployed to come and bring you what you are asking for. But there in the heavenlies, there in the skies, there in the air, there is warfare going on. There are beings there that resisted me. Who? This glorious being, this powerful being, this being upon whom Daniel set his eyes and fell like a dead man. But he's telling you, there is war up there. There are beings up there. They resisted me for 21 days. As if that is not enough, they detained me. They took me off course. And took me to the kings of Persia. Who was I fighting with? The prince. But the prince took me to the king of Persia. Who is speaking? This glorious being. That tells you the kind of warfare we are engaged in. Some people in, our, in my language, there are some songs where we sing about the devil. Say, Meaning, it doesn't have any power. It doesn't even have a tail. It doesn't even have... <laughs> Whoa! Those are songs better for nursery school. But for you mature ones, you need to know who you are dealing with. Jesus called him the strong man. 
He says, when a strong man is guarding his house, mm -mm, you cannot touch anything of his. All you need is to get the stronger than him to come and bind him and remove him and take his arms away. Then you can loot his house. And now I want you to look at that house as the territory where you live. And the goods that are being kept are the souls of men kept in captivity. You don't get any of those souls until you can secure the stronger than him to come and bind this strong man. And if you are minimizing this strong man, you are not going to be able to do that. You need to know who you are dealing with and appreciate the warfare. Some people don't even know what we are dealing with, so they take it lightly. They think we are partying all night and all day. We are at war. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds and reasonings. Casting down every imagination. And causing all thoughts to come to obedience in Jesus Christ. Who, when you know this, you keep yourselves pure. You keep yourselves set apart. That you may be able to prevail when the war starts. Someone say amen to God. Amen. So this angel says to Daniel, they took me. They bound me. They took me captive to the kings. And if it were not for your archangel Michael who came to set me free, I would still be there. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, there is a, a recording I did in South Africa 20 years ago. If you go and look for it, John Mulinde and the Strategic Spiritual Warfare. I was teaching about that very scenario. What happens when the war is going on? What signs do you get? How does the Holy Spirit signal to you that you are losing the battle? How does he guide you to take a higher ground? How does he warn you? There are times when it's normal for you to sleep, but there are nights when the Holy Spirit says, no sleep tonight. No sleep tonight. The war is intense. Keep awake and keep fighting. And if you don't, then you are going to lose. You are going to pay the price. Because I've interacted with some men who were agents of Satan. One man that I testify about in that recording I'm mentioning, his name was called Katongole. He was an agent of the devil. He used to leave his body. He would go into transcendental meditation. Leave his body and alleviate. I mean, he would go up in the skies and join with other spiritual beings. Some of them human agents, some of them spirits. And they would wage war against the church of Christ. There are things that we, can, we should get to talk about if you walk this journey with us. Where we talk about the veil that covers the nations. The veil that is over cities. And how we wage war to open up that veil. And when we open it up, what are the signs that come to us in the physical world to tell us? What is happening in the spiritual? And what happens when that opening remains or when they try to close it up? And how do you know they are closing it up? All these things, we are not blind. We are not at loss. We have been given the Holy Spirit and he tells us what is happening in the spiritual realm. So if you can go look it up, that would be very good. Because this is where we want, we want to go. We want to raise up an army that understands the spiritual realm. That is able to prevail in the spirit. And that is able to look at society and tell where society is in the spiritual battles. Because what we are talking about, discipling nations, is not just a game over. It's not a walkover. It's war. 
It's war, and this is a very intense war. You look at Paul in the book of Acts, and when they were taking him to Rome, you see how the devil is fighting so hard to destroy him, but he's able to prevail and tell everybody, calm down, we are going to be okay. Why? Because he was prevailing in the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. When you get into these levels of warfare, Christianity becomes exciting. Because you are seeing it step by step. And then you, you war and war and war. And then you know tomorrow we are going to gather in the harvest. And the harvest comes. Amen. Amen. And the harvest comes. There's a time we were in one place a long time ago, 1992. Pastor Nora, Pastor Jane, you are also there. And we waged war. We were going to go baptizing to a certain river. And the river was being used by sorcerers and witches. And we thought, oh no, let us avoid it. Because they told us so many stories about it. So we said, let us leave it. And the Lord said, no, go for it. I have given you the victory. And that night, we spent the night praying. But it's one thing to know you are going to go to war tomorrow. It's another thing when those spirits come to you. They came to us that night. And we would fight until we pushed all of them back. And they are gone. And they hey, how was it? And as we were still talking, they are back. They are back. And when they come back, they hit one. They hit another. They hit another. And these sisters go berserk. And they are losing their minds and they are shouting obscenities at the top of their voices. You, you need to get back into warfare. We, we were like that all night. And in the morning, sincerely, we were scared. <laughs> we were scared. Do we really go? Or we change programs? And then someone who was not with us in the night, someone who just came in the morning to visit, says, by the way, before I came, I had a dream. And this is the dream. And the dream was clear. Go. Go. You have the victory. And we went. And it was as if the villagers had heard about our coming. There was a gathering there. Everybody was waiting to see. Let us see what they are going to do. And we got there, we started singing songs of praise and worship, and the warfare began immediately. So at one point, we were casting out demons, we were fighting off this, then we were baptizing, and then the people were coming and saying, I also want to get baptized. And we ended up with a big crowd giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's exciting when you see... This life that we have been given is real. It's not just a feeble. It's, it's real. It's not a story. It's not a myth. So it says here, and I was talking to you, three levels of government. The personal, the societal, that is the five spheres, and then the heavenly. That's where you find that government, the power of the air. And the highest in the air controls the mid-range. The mid-range controls the personal. Now, do you know why most times we have a lot of deliverance in churches, but no change in lives? Because demons are cast out and they go out and wait by the gate. As soon as these believers are coming out and they're happy, oh, you know what happened to me? They, they get back into their vehicles to go home. And home, they find the five spheres. The family, the economy, the governance, the social norms. They go back into the dungeons. And all the pastor is dealing with is the personal bondage here. But it's not doing anything at all about the other institutional darkness. So people go back to become worse than they were before. 
And that is why we have so many churches around, but we are not changing society. But society is changing us. Our youth are dancing like the world. They're dressing like the world. And they are walking like the world. They go to the where the world wants to go. To the same orgies. Eventually we begin to make allowances for them. Oh, you've got to let them live anyway. We are of the, in the world, but we are not of the world. And this war we have got to fight, this is real. We either are losing our society to darkness, and darkness is winning our lives to it, or we are going to win the world back to the kingdom of God. Amen. And in some places, you can't share what I'm sharing with you. Yeah, in some places, they will shut you up. One time I was in, in France. <laughs> and I was sharing about the New Age agenda. Alice Bailey and the ten points of the New Age. And how they made this agenda in 1948. By the time they made it and I showed them the, the documents, it seemed unbelievable and unacceptable. But by the time I was sharing, that time it was in the mid-90s, it was almost 90% fulfilled. My host, he was driving me around. He drove me from one city to another city, drove about four hours. And uh, after sharing... One afternoon, he was visibly irritated. He was visibly angry. I called him and said, Marco, tell me, is something wrong with you? Have I said something that has offended you? At first he said, no, everything is fine. I said, the way you talk confirms that everything is not fine. Then he said, he turned to me and said, but why are you talking about those things? What difference is, is it going to make? You are just making us feel bad. You are not changing anything. You are just condemning us. I said, brother, I'm sharing that we may wake up and do something about it. Do what? I said, we can fight. Fight what? I said, okay, 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 ma. Let us leave the matter. He said, yeah, leave the matter and don't talk about it again. I knew. Now, by the way, I knew without the locals giving me the platform, I was helpless. I either had to win it by force or I had to receive it by cooperation. That's why he said, when you find a man of peace, stay in that house. And if there's no man of peace, let you, the dust of your feet remain there. There are certain things we can do, but there are th certain things we cannot do. Because authority is not usurped. Authority is either won through battle or conferred through cooperation. Amen? And if they don't cooperate with you and you have not at one time I was in the Netherlands and I had a, a prophetic picture of what God wanted to do with the Netherlands I shared it with them and they cried and they were crying Lord we want this and the Lord said to me are you willing to stay here and pay the price to set this territory free as you did in your own country Ah, in the end, I had to be sincere. I said, Lord, I'm not. I'm not ready. My family is back home. My ministry is back home. I don't have anything here. There must be something bigger to bring me here. I said, pray that there will be men and women of the land who will rise up and embrace this. It's the same thing. I come to South Africa. I can't fight for South Africa. I can't. All I can do is to 
paint the picture as vivid as I can and invite you, can we walk together? I will share everything that I've learned, but you have the authority. This is your land. You are the stewards that God has put in the land. If you don't rise to take it, I cannot say, if they don't want, I'll go and take it myself. I have no authority like that. I can do that on my own land. In my land, Uganda. Because I have a God-given birthright there. Amen? If, if we understood all these things, we would work more closely together. We would cooperate with one another. We would facilitate one another. We would support one another. We would receive help from others. And we would see more victories. Amen. I think I should be closing right now. Amen. So the picture I've just been painting, you can go back and read those three verses. But that, that picture is a picture of the kingdom of darkness on earth. How it rules. But I want to remind you, greater is he who is on our side than he who is in the world. If we cooperate and we go back and dig into the word of God, we have all that it takes to take back our nations. We will be talking much later, and my colleagues here will also be sharing, how do we establish, you know, in the World War, the forces, the Western Allies were fighting against the Nazis in a way, and uh, they had what they called the beachhead. Do you remember what the beachhead was? Anyone knows? Beachhead, they had, like, in, the, in Normandy, the Germans were on land, and they controlled the land. The allies were coming from the sea, and they wanted to land <laughs> on Normandy. But how do you land when the others are focusing their artilleries against you? They had to fight. So many died, but they had to fight and create a beachhead. It's an area they took over on the beach. They were surrounded by enemy forces, but they took that, and that became their foothold. How do we establish a foothold in a society governed by darkness? Because once we have a foothold, all heaven is going to support that foothold. Heaven is going to come and build a wall around that foothold. And then we can plan how to expand. We want to talk about this in a practical way. How do we gain a foothold in Pretoria? How do we gain a foothold for the whole of South Africa in one particular part of South Africa from which we begin to expand and take over territory? Remember our battles are fought on three fronts. They strategic, that's the heavenly places. Until you overthrow that one, you are not going to reign anywhere near the, down here. And if you destabilize that one long enough, you can destabilize the second level, the mid-range level. Once you destabilize that long enough, you can set captives free. And when captives are set free, you have an army, an army, sorry, with which you can begin to take over territory. Amen? Amen? This kind of war is coordinated. You cannot choose and say, for me, I'm going to remain at deliverance level. I don't go at strategic level. Do you remember when Jesus was walking in the streets of Jerusalem? Was it Jerusalem? And the demons saw him. And they began to scream, what do you want with us, you holy one of God? We know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Do you think you, those were demons at just deliverance level? Those were at mid-range. They were societal spirits. They saw him come in and they saw a new authority coming in. Look at the legion. Legion saw him get out of the boat and step on the land. And the man with the legion came running and said, What do you want with us? What do you want with us? He says, who are you? We are legend because we are so many. 
please don't cast us. And he said, are you going to cast us out into the pit before the day? The devil knows the end. He knows the end. The end is he's defeated. But he knows the time has not yet come. You cannot cast me out. There will be those times, by the way, when the devil comes and says, okay, let us talk peace. <laughs> you want to plant a city, a church in the city? I'm going to allow you a church. It's going to be big. You'll get a lot of money. Don't attack me. Don't attack me. Those things we have experienced. When you read the book of... Uh, Ed Silvoso, in the city of Rosario, he was praying for the city of Rosario. The devil comes and says, stop, or I'm going to kill you. And he says, no way. I'm here on assignment. I'm continuing. And the, the, and the devil comes and says, okay. Okay, you take one part of the city, I take another part. <laughs> I'll allow you freedom there. You allow me freedom this way. Eddie Silvoso continues praying. Then the devil comes again in the dream and says, okay, I will allow you to plant a big church, take over the whole city, but stop. Don't pray against me. Don't talk about me. <laughs> and Eddie Silvoso continued until the, the thing fled and he planted the biggest church in Rosario. The same God is alive for you. As for Ed Silvoso. Come on, give the glory to God. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Jim says, the same God of Elijah who called upon God and the rain came is you, the same God you serve. And he's alive. And his son, Jesus Christ, is coming back soon. And he wants you and I to prepare the way for him. Brothers and sisters, all I'm trying to do is to provoke you to that place where you say, let's go for it. South Africa belongs to Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's believe God for it. Let's join hands together. It's the victory does not belong to this church or to that church, to that denomination or to that denomination, to that race or to that race. It belongs to the people who are called by the name of the Lord. And let us join hands together and see that taste and see that God is good. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.